Mario Vargas Llosa, or as some people say, Josa or Yosa, is arguably Peru's most famous author. I'm trying to read one book from every country in the world, so when it came to Peru, I knew that I wanted to read something from him. But he's got a ton of books, so it was kind of hard to pin down which to read. And I decided to go with Death in the Andes. So... Does he live up to the hype? Well, let's talk about it. This is a series I'm calling Unfiltered Reviews. I literally just finished reading this book and I'm hopping on camera right away to share my thoughts without really writing anything down ahead of time. No notes, no bullet points. These are just kind of my, well, unfiltered thoughts. If you're into this type of content, a little bit more off the cuff, less polished, less editing, please let me know and I will continue to do them. Your feedback is really important to me. A lot of people would probably not pick Death in the Andes as your first Losa read. And I think that's just because he's got a few works that are much more critically acclaimed. Not to say that this book is bad, but doing a little bit of research on it uh, as I was midway through reading it, it seemed like it was kind of like, yeah, good book, not really controversial one way or the other as far as it's his best, it's his worst, just another solid book from this guy. Where some of his other works like Conversations in the Cathedral, uh, Feast of the Goat, things like that are really popular and kind of quintessential Losa. But I really just kind of liked the overall theme of this book. It's a quasi whodunit, kind of a detective mystery book, but it's obviously very literary and tackles a lot of the similar themes and uses a lot of the same styles that Losa uses in his other works, or so I've heard. Obviously, this is the only one that I've read, but I did read that it kind of was an intersection of some major themes regarding the politics in Peru, uh, the communist parties in Peru, the indigenous peoples of Peru, and those types of topics tend to appeal to me. And that's really why I picked this book. I'm actually not much of a mystery or detective novel reader usually, but I liked that such a highly regarded author in the literary space uh, wrote a book that was kind of more on the fun-ish detective side. I don't know, something about that really appealed to me. Right off the bat, I can tell you that this book was not at all what I expected. I guess I didn't really know that much about uh, Losa's writing, other than I've heard some people say that some of his books are quite challenging. This one certainly is not, in my opinion. I thought it was very approachable. It follows the story of Corporal Latuma, who is a uh, basically a cop and what they call the Civil Guard, and he's been stationed in a remote outpost in the Andes in a town called Nacos. And during his time there, a few people go missing, and he's trying to investigate what happened to them. The character of Latuma is actually featured in another um, Losa work, but these are not, it's not like a sequel or anything like that. They're very much standalone novels. It's just a character that he, for one reason or another, carried over. I can't remember the name of that novel off the top of my head. One thing that was challenging for me as an American reader was that there's a lot of Peruvian politics and language and culture in here that if you're not familiar with will be a little bit confusing. And when I say Peruvian language, what I mean is the words are obviously Spanish words, but they're kind of exclusively used in Peru to refer to certain things there or specific dialects within the country. And there are no indigenous uh, languages used in the book, but they are referenced. Uh, so that's also pretty interesting. And some of the phrases are very similar. So, for example, they refer to the terrorists as Tarucos. And they refer to the people that live in the mountains as Sarucos. So that's very similar. The actual political party, uh, it, they're the Senderistas or Senderas. Uh, those two words are used kind of interchangeably. So that's a little confusing. There's also Huecos, which are landslides. And then there's also Hueno, which I believe is music. And then there's also... Uh, 
Huayan Keo, uh, which is a town. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but it's a it's a town in the book. So as an English speaker, exclusively an English speaker, uh, it took a little bit of time to kind of wrap my head around these terms. There's no explanation of them really in the book, so I did have to look them up as I was reading. And because they're not necessarily broadly Spanish words, I had to dig a little bit even to understand not just the definition, but like the context. It wasn't uh, a lot of cases you couldn't just like pop it into Google Translate and get the answer you're looking for. You literally had to Google it and like look it up on a Wikipedia page or something like that. Once that was out of the way, the reading was pretty smooth sailing from there with one exception, which is the way that Losa writes dialogue in this book. And I guess this is something that he uses and at least conversation to the cathedral. And I know that because my podcast co-host Andy uh, had mentioned that when he read a portion of conversations in the cathedral. And what Losa does is he'll have two characters in real time having a conversation. And one character will be relating a story from the past to the other character. So it's he's writing a flashback scene, essentially. But during the flashback scene, there are characters in the flashback that are also conversing with one another. And then the person in real time that is hearing the story is then adding their own commentary to it. And there's no page markings or anything to indicate when the time jumps back and forth. Sometimes it's paragraph by paragraph, sometimes it's line by line even. So like one line will be present, the next line will be uh, from the flashback, and then the next line will be from the commentary back from the present. So it, that style was also initially a little bit confusing. However, Losa was so good at writing distinct voices for each character, it became pretty easy to get into the conversations with the flashbacks and understand who was saying what and in what context. This style of dialogue writing was very unique for me. I've never read anything like that that I can recall, but it did remind me of cinema because this does get used in cinema sometimes where there might be a flashback with the characters who are in present time commenting or narrating on that uh, flashback. And the first movie that really came to mind, although I'm sure there's probably many examples, was Boondock Saints. So in Boondock Saints, Willem Dafoe's character, uh, Agent Smecker, I think his name was, will show up at a crime scene. He'll kind of look around and then do his investigation and then kind of relay back to the other detectives what he thought happened. And then, of course, on screen, as Smecker is describing how he thinks the crime went down, you know, it's being visually represented as a flashback on the screen. However, the detectives that are hearing Smecker's version of the crime are then also asking questions or commenting on what Smecker's describing. So it kind of has that similar flow to it. That is one of the reasons why I think this would make a fantastic movie. The other reason is there's so many different narratives. And so there's lots of fragments of people's stories in this book. So when it comes to the terrorist organization of The Shining Path, which was, I guess, technically the official Communist Party, in Peru, although Peruvian politics, I think, are quite complicated, especially in that era, which was like, I think the uh, late 80s, early 90s. This book came out in 93, and I, I think it was supposed to be like a current kind of time period in the book as well. They will cut to a scene with some characters who have nothing to do with the main storyline, and they will... Uh, basically show like what happens to these people in a very truncated timeline in their time in Peru and, and coming across the Tarucos and the Shining Path guerrilla group and uh, just kind of how the violence that was happening there. Because of that, I think it would make a really interesting movie. The other part of it too is there is a love story in this book and that's always popular in cinema. It definitely has that kind of lowbrow humor, almost lewdness to it. It's disguising those deeper themes, those more important themes. And in that way, the book kind of reminded me of Inherent Vice by Thomas Pynchon, which is kind of billed as a detective 
noir. And obviously you can do a surface level read on it, or you can also dig up the common themes in a pension novel, which are those distrust of the government, paranoia, uh, government corruption, things of that nature. So if you've read Inherent Vice by Thomas Pynchon, I do think you would like this book, although the writing styles are quite different. But this was a certainly laugh out loud funny book. There were many moments where I just thought this is ridiculous. I wish someone were reading along with me so we could like stop and chat about how funny it is. Again, in the same way you would enjoy watching a movie with a friend. And that's just another reason why I think it would make a fantastic film. From reading this book, I learned a lot about Peruvian politics, history, indigenous culture. This book does a pretty good job of showing the conflicts that came about when you had indigenous Peruvian cultures facing globalization, modernization, industrialization, as well as government corruption and then political extremism. The, in that way, this book also reminded me of War Trash by Ha Jin and The Sympathizer by Viet Thanh Nguyen and Last Boat Out of Shanghai by Helen Zia. Andy and I talked about this on our most recent episode, which comes out Friday, July 28th, something like that. The theme in those books is in Western culture in America, we kind of have this like communism bad kind of thought process. And I'm not here making, you know, an argument for the, the positive sides of communism, but with all of these cases of Vietnam, Korea, uh, China, and now what I've seen from this book in Peru is that a lot of people were kind of just caught in the middle between two bad choices, between a rock and a hard place. And so using China as an example is that when the communist revolution happened in China and Mao's party took over, they took over power from Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists who were not serving their people well. There was a lot of government oppression. There was a lot of people living in poverty, a lot of people being murdered by the government. And so a lot of people look at what happened with the communist revolution and it was kind of jumping from the frying pan into the fire. Very similar story in the Koreas, very similar story in Vietnam. And in this book, obviously the shining path guerrilla group is going around and killing people, but uh, they also were fighting against the current Peruvian government, which had tons of corruption and killed just as many, if not more, indigenous Peruvians and citizens. So do with that what you will, but just kind of interesting that it doesn't matter where you go in the globe, these uh, situations kind of keep popping up over and over again. Now, one thing that I will say about this book, and I did listen to a podcast about this uh, before I finished and will definitely help you when you read this book, if you read this book, and something that didn't make sense to me as I was reading it until I got this information from this podcast. One of the leaders of the Shining Path Communist Party, guerrilla, paramilitary, whatever you want to call them, said that there was a blood quota for the indigenous peoples of Peru. They called them Indians, of the Indians of Peru. And that did not mean that war is going to happen and unfortunately innocent people are going to perish. This guy literally said these people have to die in order for us to achieve the aims of our party, which ultimately will be better for everybody, including, you know, the people that survived this. Uh, so if you do read this book, keep that in mind. I don't want to, I can't say much more without spoiling things, but there were certain things that were happening in the book. I was a little confused about, and I kind of realized like I need some context on Peruvian history in this period. And I found this great video about it. And when I heard that quote and understood what the guy was saying, everything kind of clicked into place for me. So 
I definitely will read more from Mario Vargas Llosa. I really enjoyed this book. My only gripe with it is, and he has, you know, the author has no obligations to me or anyone else. I would have appreciated probably another hundred pages where he could have fleshed out the details of some of those politics in the story a little bit more. If you are familiar with Peruvian culture and history, probably not necessary. But for anyone that's not intimately involved with it, I think there was just a little bit of context missing. And the writing was so good that his writing could have easily carried another 100 pages, made it interesting, added to the plot, and given a little bit more depth to some of these political factions that are playing a role in the story. He doesn't owe anything to an international audience, to an American audience. Uh, but obviously, growing, growing up in America, we learned basically nothing about Peru in our traditional education. So I am actually probably going to read something else by him this year. If you have any recommendations, please let me know. And if you haven't read this one yet, but you're a Losa fan, I would say definitely check it out. That was me, unfiltered. Was that cool? I don't know. Does this suck? Is it boring? Let me know.